So I am a citizen scientist. And by the time I'm through with you today, I hope that you will all find a way to become a citizen scientist. And the way I'm going to try to get you there is to tell you about my own journey to becoming a citizen scientist. So it started about 10 years ago. I was researching a book that I was writing about evolution. And to better understand how evolution works, it's actually pretty complicated when you really drill down into it, I went over to the California Academy of Sciences in Golden Gate Park. A lot of the scientists that work at the academy are taxonomists. So taxonomists study speciation when a new life form comes into being and they name it. If they're lucky, they get to discover a new species. They name it and they put it on this vast tree of life. The vast tree of life we are all on. So the moment when Homo sapiens became separate from our ape ancestors, that earned our place on the tree of life. Now, all life forms have common ancestors, so Earth Day should really be celebrated as a big family reunion. <laughs> Taxonomy is an old profession, typical kind of uh, ivory, very ivory tower science, very sure of its pathway. And most of the scientists at the academy, especially 10 years ago, were old white guys, very certain of the truth. So imagine I'm talking to one, and it, he's a classic, cut in the mold. So taxonomists are also the ones, they have the big trays of pinned butterflies, pinned ants. The academy, I think last time I checked, had something like 25 million specimens. That's birds in drawers and fish in jars. So this guy has eyebrows out to here. He's sitting behind his desk. He's got you know, gigantic piles of books all around him. And he's emphatic. And as he's talking to me, his, his glasses come down off his face and skitter off of his desk. And he says, yes, I will tell you how life forms originate. But let me first tell you how they are prematurely being terminated. So it's 10 years later, right? Now you've probably all heard this term, sixth mass extinction. But this is 10 years ago, and I had never heard that. And he said, we are today, 10 years ago, and we are still in it. We are experiencing the loss of species at a rate and magnitude that equals that which took out the dinosaurs. This event is already discernible in the fossil record. And in geological time, that is happening like this. And he starts to cry. And I was taken aback. You know, I just was like, ugh, this is not a touchy-feely guy. This is not somebody who cries in an interview. And I, thought, I felt sorry for him. I thought maybe he was having trouble at home. <laughs> maybe his wife was unhappy with him. So I go to the next scientist who also wants to talk extinction, and he wants to talk, he wants to tell me that as he goes around the world, and he's lucky enough to study subjects in Africa, in Asia, and in the US, he goes back once a year to each of his study sites, and he says, I go back and they're disappearing. We're, di we're losing species before we even know they're there. Because the habitats, the wild places, are being transformed for human use, to agriculture, to buildings, to roadways. It's happening at such a pace that it's driving this extinction. And this is the major cause of extinction. This extinction crisis is loss of habitat. So this is the Xerxes blue butterfly. It's the first invertebrate known to have gone extinct due to human impacts. And that happened when Golden Gate Park was made, when the coastal scrub dunes of the San Francisco Peninsula were transformed into a green leafy idea of a park, the butterfly lost its habitat and went extinct. This is an ivory-billed woodpecker. These are two ivory-billed woodpeckers. And that specimen at the academy, which was on the ex exhibit floors, is almost as tall as I am. So those birds are huge. And a rule of thumb is that the bigger a, an animal a species is, the more habitat it needs. So the ivory-billed woodpecker lived in the vast uh, forests of the East Coast. And as that forest was fragmented by human impacts, by buildings and roadways, it lost enough habitat for itself that it couldn't survive in smaller spaces. So it went extinct. So this guy is telling me that. And today, even more than losing this number of species that are having their life histories terminated, we're also losing vast numbers of bodies of plants and animals. So this is maybe species that are included in this are not exactly going extinct yet, but the numbers of their bodies on the Earth is vastly decreasing. So this issue of Science Magazine is from 2014. You'll see that the title of it is Vanishing Fauna. And the main um, article, the main scientific publication in this issue was the main author on that is a scientist here at Stanford, Rodolfo Dirzo, and God bless him. 
the title of the paper is Defaunation of Planet Earth. So defaunation, I think that's an argument that scientists should not get to name anything. <laughs> like, that sounds like something you get done at the salon and don't talk about at the dinner table, right? <laughs> In fact, honestly, I don't know why we are talking about anything else. So in the past 40 years, we have 28% fewer vertebrates, 35% fewer butterflies and moths, and 1.5 billion fewer birds living on this earth than we did 40 years ago. And this is not just from one study, this is from a lot of studies. <coughs> so actually, that's also happening in your backyards. It's not just Africa, it's not just Asia, it's in our own backyards. But it's cryptic, we don't know exactly how it's happening. We can make these big assessments of, of, a, of loss based on how much habitat's gone. And then there are ways that we've counted. So what are we going to do about it? He starts to cry. The second scientist starts to cry. And I'm thinking, like, this is crazy, but now I'm really getting it, right? They're all going to freaking cry on me. So, like, the next guy I go to talk to, I bring my tissues. And when the third scientist cried, I cried with him. There's no way to overstate this. We have to face this. But how? So the second part of my journey to becoming a citizen scientist took me to the spine of the continent. That's this vast mega linkage of the Rockies from Alaska all the way down to Mexico. By the way, there's still a lot of wildlife left. There's plenty to save. And when you bring habitat back, they come back. When you build it, they come. So along the spine of the continent, we still have grizzly bears and wolves in the north, we still have jaguar in the south, and, we've, and sometimes people call this a biotic conveyor belt because so much wildlife lives along the spine of the continent. And I found some stories that were real success stories along the spine of the continent, not only animals and plants being saved, but according to some models that could actually scale to the level of the problem. So I'll just tell you about this one, which is the path of the pronghorn. And the pronghorn antelope is an ancient species, goes dates back to the Pleistocene. Today, the pronghorn antelope is the second fastest land animal on the Earth, bested only by an African cheetah. And it's so fast because it evolved with an American cheetah that no longer exists. Now, the pronghorn don't have to keep running that fast, but they do. They're a little OCD also. So they <laughs> come up to that fence. You can see they're like, uh, duh, I'm going to try to go through it. So there, there's a single herd of antelope that makes a single migration in Wyoming. They spend the summer in Jackson Hole, who wouldn't, right? And then they go south. And there were some scientists studying this herd of antelope and noticing in the southern part of the range that there were, they were carcasses of them all over the place. And it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out the reason was that fracking had just been invented there. So when you do something like fracking is invented somewhere, immediately, quickly, hundreds and hundreds of wells are being dug. Human infra infrastructure comes in very fast. I mean, buildings go up to house workers, and schools go up to, to educate their children. We're going to get that gas, and we're going to start shipping it out, and we're going to start making money. So again, this huge infrastructure and the pronghorn just plow right into it. Plow right into the semis, right into the trains, and they die. So these scientists did a couple of things that today would be called citizen science and that are critical to what citizen science is. So they convened people. They didn't just get other scientists to study this. They didn't just get politicians to support it. They didn't just connect with nonprofit activists. They most importantly connected with regular people like you and I who live near or along the, the path of the pronghorn. And they said, you know, they went door to door, like, we want to see if pronghorn go through your backyard. And that person would say, well, you know, once a year we see pronghorn in our front yard when we are on our way to work. And then when we come home, they're gone. But we didn't know that we were on this pathway, that we're, not, we're seeing this one moment in time, right? But that moment in time is not only connected to that yearly migration, that one moment in time is connected to a migration that has gone on for at least 6,000 years. Of course, we want to protect the path of the pronghorn. Of course, we want to be part of this beautiful historic life history of this animal. The path of the pronghorn today has protection. It's the only animal movement that has protection in the lower 48. And we have to do that a lot more. Now here, we have a tool for doing it a lot more. This is a, s a screenshot from iNaturalist. This is one of my favorite citizen science platforms. 
You can, it's free. You put it on your phone. I suggest you all get onto iNaturalist today. It's easier to do it on a desktop or a laptop and then to put it on your phone as the app. So all of those blue dots represent people seeing pronghorn antelope taking a photograph of what they see. The app assigns the photographic observation the date, the time, the latitude, and the longitude of the photograph. So you'll hear people tell you citizens can't take data the same way that professionals can. Well, first of all, there's a lot of studies that show the opposite. In many cases, citizens are better at it. But in any case, with iNaturalist, all that's out of there because it's GPS, it's the atomic clock, it's date, time, latitude, longitude. It is that, that observation in time. There's lots of different ways to get involved with citizen science. If you don't want to do it technologically, there's lots of other ways to do it. The important thing is I want you to know that we need to save nature and that we, it's a mob-sourced thing. The only way to do it, what we want to do with something like iNaturalist is create this big biodiversity observation network. The, there's an instrument for that. It's our eyes. It's we do it together. When we get this, we get data for all these kinds of species that you can see on iNaturalist and things like eBird and Nature's Notebook. You can see these patterns of how life is unfolding, get predictions of where extinctions are happening, and then make surgical strikes like protections like the path of the pronghorn to help those animals and plants. Now I will tell you one more story about citizen science. It is not just about collecting data. Citizen science is also a practice a practice that can help us do something that is very important, which is to get in better, healthier alignment with our own place in the cycle of life. About five years ago, I took my father up to Hawk Hill in Sausalito, where I participate in a hawk watch. This is a 20 picture from 2012, uh, where we had this huge surge of broad-winged hawks. So those are all broad-winged hawks in that photograph. And it's at this pattern that it's an anomalous year has actually been associated with a, a greater, a quicker melting of sea level ice, which changed the currents, the air currents that the birds fly on, and actually brought birds from the east coast to the west coast. So this is where you start to see that you see a pattern from the citizen science data that scientists can use to correlate with other things going on to figure out what's happening. So my father says to me, this is what you do. You are looking through your binoculars up at the sky, and you are watching one instance of life go from one point to another, because the birds seem to come out of nowhere, and then they fly across, and we watch them. This is a northern harrier. And I said, yes, that's what we do. We watch one instance of life, and we take note of it. He said, that's spiritual. So I knew what he meant, because really the wisdom traditions all ask us, if you want to deepen your experience of life, the first thing to do is to start observing. Observe your own breath, observe your own thoughts going by. Why wouldn't we actually add this to our spiritual practice to actually keep biodiversity going? So two years ago, my father died. He died of lung cancer, and as he was dying, I was sitting by his bedside watching him, and he was watching me and I realized I am watching an instance of life go from here to who knows where. So then in the subsequent years after his death, of course, I've thought about him up there on Hawk Hill. Now the hawks that we see on the west coast are almost all juvenile hawks. They're fledgling year hawks. Nobody knows why, because on the east coast, the hawks they see in their hawk migration are mostly adults. They're mostly two-year-old birds or older. It is thought that perhaps the passage over the Golden Gateway is harrowing for the hawks and that they learn a better way south when they're older. So I'm watching these juvenile hawks, and I'm thinking, the reason this generation is here is because of thousands of years of generations that have gone before, that have brought these hawks here. You know, it's fine, my father was old enough to die. It was in the natural order of things. But I think about my children, right? They're fledgling. My daughter is about to graduate from college this year. She's about to go on her first migration into the world. What kind of world are we sending the next generation into? Darwin called life that vast tree of life, endless forms, most beautiful. This is the story we can tell only together using citizen science. Thank you.